Hi, I'm Chanel. The second draft of the Assisted Dying Bill is set to go before the House of Keys on Tuesday. This week, politicians on the Isle of Man have been hearing about the Assisted Dying Bill and the views of some local and UK-based groups on the issue. Here you can listen to the full interviews of Nathan Stilwell, Professor Kevin Yule, Dr Ben Harris and Alan Desmond. So my name's Nathan Stilwell and I am the Assisted Dying Campaigner for Humanists UK. So one of the most important things um, for us is, is actually to, to almost um, look and listen because the Isle of Man is moving forwards on this issue. It does look like there's a, a lot of um, really positive debate when this is happening and it, it does look like there, there could be enough support to actually have a, a really compassionate and a really good assisted dying law. So I'm over to, to talk to the politicians to see if I can understand their if they've got any concerns, but also to 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 welcome the fact that they're they're engaging with this debate so positively and in such a good manner. Right, and I understand the group also had responded to Dr. Allinson's survey. Am I right? Yes. So we did respond to the to the, to the survey. We outlined that at the moment the the um, assisted dying law that's being proposed will be for people who have six months or left 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 to live. Now the the Humanist UK perspective on that is that we think that laws around assisted dying should be based on reducing unnecessary suffering. So we think it shouldn't be necessarily based on how long you've got to live, but if you are suffering from a physical condition that gives you intolerable pain and intolerable suffering, that should be enough criteria to to make you eligible to make that choice if you want to make that choice. So will that be one of the suggestions that you make when you do speak to members? Look at adding that on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, any assisted dying law will be better than the, the status quo that we have right now, where people are forced to go abroad, people are forced into often traumatic and, and horrific um, situations. And, and there have been people from the Isle of Man who have gone to um, centres like Dignitas in Switzerland for assisted deaths. And that's quite traumatising for their families who have to go on private jets and, and flee their homes, essentially. But I will be making the case for the most compassionate law possible. And in my mind, the most compassionate law possible is a law that incorporates people who have things like motor neuron disease and neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's that might not have six months left to live, but will be suffering and could be suffering for quite a long time. And I think those people deserve a compassionate end if they want it. Um, Speaking of that, I had spoken to a group yesterday um, It was a group of parents, and it has to do with autism, but they had concerns around autism. I think in the Netherlands, I think um, if someone is autistic and they'd like to go through with it, then they can go through with the procedure. So I think they had concerns around that. What do you say to people who have, you know, those concerns, who air those kinds of concerns? Absolutely. So so I I did reach out to that charity and I I would very much welcome the opportunity to to talk to them about this because I think, you know, it's really important that we talk about these concerns and we can look at it. The first thing I'll say is that it, 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 it doesn't look particularly relevant to the law in, in the Isle of Man. So the Isle of Man, we know for a fact, will be reserved just for adults. So no one under the age of 18 will be, be eligible. And it will not be for psychological um, uh, illnesses at all. It will just be for physical illnesses. And at the moment, as I said, it's just linked to people with six months left to live. So even in the, the Netherlands where they are eligible, autism alone isn't enough to, to have an assisted death. There must be what they term to be intolerable suffering. So again, I, I, I don't see any merit in forcing anyone to suffer, whether you have autism or, or, or not. It should really be based on if someone has come to a clear and settled choice to end their lives and they have a physical and curable condition, then they should have that, that choice. How important is it for people to be able to make their choice known? I think it's really, that's the crux of the issue. It's vital for them. It's my body, it's my choice, it's my death, it's my decision. And what I'm coming here to say with my my humanist um, perspective on as well is that society is changing. We're seeing a a massive uptick in people who say that they have no religion. We're seeing changing demographics and societal attitudes. Now, the best way to uh, allow for a, a very mixed society is to give people individual choice. If you don't want an assisted death, don't have an assisted death, don't go anywhere near the process. But if it's something that I want and it's something that I think people should have that choice, that choice should be available to them. And here on the island, we have had some people that are 
that 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 do want to have that choice. Um, if the bill goes through, how long do you think it will be until we actually see it here on the island? I think that's a really good question, and the the, the the cop out answer is that with politics, we never know how long things will take. We have also said that in, in consultations we've done in other jurisdictions, we do think that an implementation period is a good idea. So that that's having six months, a year, two years to to get the training ready, to get the systems ready, to make sure that it, it that you've got the most compassionate and safe working assisted dying system that you have. Uh, available. That being said, it does look like the Isle of Man is moving very positively on this subject, moving forwards on this subject. So it really depends on how the politicians themselves can work on the legislation, can get a get, get a safe and most importantly compassionate law through, and then we should be able to see maybe the first assisted death on the island by something like 2025. Right, because I was going to ask, you know, once it is passed, how soon can we perhaps see the the first person raise their hand and say, I want to go through with this? Well, you see, in, 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 there are many countries that have legalized very, very recently. So uh, there are some Australian states that have legalized recently. There's, there's Spain and Austria that have legalized in the past two years. And you do see first, you see lots of doctors put their hands up and say, yes, this is something I'm ready to be part of. And then you do see a, a slow increase in the number of people. And then that's based on things like awareness. So even if the law passed, I know we talk about this every day, but there'll be people who don't know that it's an option for them, who haven't thought about it before. And then we'll also see, kind of a maybe a normalization of, of people realizing that this is a normal choice that they can have and a, an option that they, they might want so it, it really depends but it, on especially on the Isle of Man it, it won't be massive numbers it will be very very small especially at the at the start but I think just giving people a choice when, when I've spoken with people in countries that that do have this option the moment they they pass the assessment so that the doctor says yes you, you can have an assisted death you see shoulders relax you see a real change in their mentality and it doesn't mean that actually they're going to have the assisted death it just means that they know that if their suffering reached to a point where it's just intolerable that they could have their option and again it's all about options it's all about choice that's what's important here for these people you know can you talk us through like what kind of suffering or what kind of feelings or emotions they could be going through yeah, I mean, I speak with people, I would say, every week um, who have uh, been affected by the law as it stands. I spoke to a, a humanist celebrant recently who did the, the funeral for someone who begged their partner every single day for the last two weeks of their lives for their partner to kill them. Now, that feels horrible to talk about. It feels horrible to say, I can't imagine what it would be like to be on either side of that. I can't imagine what it would be like to hear the person I love beg me to kill them. And I can't imagine what it would be like to beg the person I love to, to kill me. It, it's just th that level of suffering exists in the world, unfortunately. And it's really those people that, that we should have the choice. I can't see any reason why you would go to someone who's in so much pain and so much suffering that, 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 that they want to go down this path and say, no, you must suffer. I, that's something that I can never comprehend, is how you could look someone in the eyes who's got a, who's got a really aggressive cancer, who's got a motor neuron disease or something like that that's causing them pain and just say, no, I think suffering's the right answer here. It doesn't make sense. Now, reading through the bill, as you read through it, did you find, was there anything, anything in the bill that concerned you or where you wanted to raise a point or something that could have been changed around or just maybe explained a little bit differently? Um, weirdly, I, I, I'd say no on that. I, I think the, the, the first time I saw the bill, I think that they're, they're already going down a compassionate path. And I have, a, I have quite good trust in, the, in the, the parliamentarians I've spoken to that they're going in the right way. And I will say that the, the Swiss law, if you look at the Swiss law, it's like one line. I think Article 115 says something like you must not um, kill someone for selfish purposes or you must not assist in the end of a life for selfish purposes. So their law is one line. It's very simple. But what is that the safety measures in Switzerland are done in things like framework are worked out with doctors. It's highly regulated. Every single death is investigated by the police no matter what. So these sorts of things. So not everything has to be in the legislation. 
that you can uh, introduce safeguards and you can introduce other things at diff different levels. And, you know, it, it, having something is always going to be better than what we've got now where, there, where there's nothing, where people can end their treatment, people can stop eating and drinking, and there's no regulation on, uh, on that where it stands. So really, the introduction of any law will be such an important and positive step forwards. Now I think the politicians of the Isle of Man should be focusing on how can we get the most compassionate law possible. If we think about the, the types of people that we've, we've been talking about, so that, that there's that very serious case that I just mentioned, but I, I'm, you know, I'm aware of uh, there was a recent case of, uh, I think it's Simon and bigger staff and his wife Sue, and Simon had motor neuron disease and was paralysed after a couple of weeks, and it had a really kind of traumatic end. I think the parliamentarians and the politicians on the Isle of Man should be thinking about Simon, should be thinking about these people and saying, what sort of hoops would we want to force them through? How can we give them the most compassionate end possible? How can we give them the power to make decisions over their own lives? And any sort of safeguards that get put in, any sort of safety measures should be thinking about the suffering people and thinking about what's the best case for these people who are suffering. Now, what's your advice if someone, let's just say someone is keen for it, they want to, they, they want to eventually go ahead with the procedure, but they don't know how to break the news to their family or friends. They don't know how to start that conversation. Do you have any advice or any word, anything that you can share with us? I would say that that's something that we've seen abroad. So when countries have introduced um, assisted dying regulation, we've seen in Canada that, that priests have been invited um, to give the last rites whilst the person's still alive and the person's there and their, their whole family's gathered. And that's almost a reason to have a law, is to improve these conversations. I think we can be a bit kind of stiff upper lip and a bit Victorian when it comes to talking about dying and death and having these conversations openly. I, I've had conversations with my family about what sort of funeral I want and, and what's important for me as a, as a humanist and a, as an individual, what sort of provisions I want around my death and I, I know what my parents want for their deaths. So opening that conversation early is really, really important because this can be a contentious issue with family members. We have seen you know, family members who say, I want an assisted death and then their family, their loved ones disagree so having these conversations early and open and frankly are really important and I think that's again why we should have a law is so we can have these conversations in the most frankest manner possible and what's your message to those who are against it um, I, I would say that, you know, listen to the evidence, look, look what's abroad, but also I'd ask you to respect my choice and respect the choice of the people on, on the island. As I said, if you don't want an assisted death, don't have an assisted death. Don't block me from uh, having rights over my own body. Don't stop me from being able to make a choice at the end of my life. And again, I, I just question how you can look someone who's suffering in the eye and say, you must suffer. It just doesn't doesn't compute in my brain. My last question, and I just I just thought about this now. You can tell me if you want to answer it or not. So, a few months back, I think it was in February when the bill and the consultation just opened, or it was just coming to a close. I had a call in the newsroom, and it was someone from across. I'm not sure if it was Leeds or Lincolnshire, one of the two, and he said that he's he is suffering. He's in pain. He was supposed to go to. Um, Switzerland, but he, 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 he couldn't do it. So he said he's been following the situation here. And if it does come into play, he'd like to see how he could come and get it done on the Isle of Man. And earlier this morning, I spoke to someone who's, who, who, who said if they be believe if it is something that goes through, the Isle of Man will be known as Death Island. I don't know if you'd want to comment on that at all. Yeah, absolutely. So the bill was, uh, and the consultation that was put forward put forward a, a residency requirement. So someone would have to, to live on the island for, for 12 months. So that would stop any idea of Death Island. We also see, you know, when we talk about Switzerland, I talk about people having to flee their homes to go abroad for their, their assisted deaths. People don't want to flee their homes. People want to die at home. People want to die surrounded by their loved ones. That's, a, that's the most beautiful way to go, isn't and that's what when you ask the majority of people that's what they want they don't want to go abroad I can't imagine people wanting to go abroad 12 months ahead of their their death the you know if, if they're that close to death that they don't want to to move and so I, I I don't think that would be a major concern 
at all, in fact. I, th I think the residency, residency requirement would stop people coming straight away. But as, as I said, people want this in their own countries. They don't want to have to travel. And it's morally wrong to force people to travel to have the death that they deserve. Is there anything you'd like to add or you'd like to say? I'd just say really, really, really take the the, the people of the Isle of Man and they're, they're suffering seriously. You know, it, there, are people who are, there are people who have gone to Switzerland. There are people who are suffering from motor neuron disease. These people are the people that you should be talking to and they, they want a compassionate choice at the end of their lives. We can't take this into a, this debate into a silo and talk about it on just philosophical grounds without actually talking to the people who are affected by the current law and to the people who would benefit from a, a very compassionate assisted dying law. Last question. Uh, I know you mentioned the uh, people with motor neuron disease. Um, so is that a suggestion you're going to make tomorrow? And would you like to see them um, bring that in as well? Absolutely. I think people with neurodegenerative diseases should have the option of a, an assisted death. So unfortunately, with someone with motor neuron disease, it's possible that they could suffer for, for essentially years before a doctor would deem that they have, um, they have a terminal illness and they have six months left to live. And that just seems absolutely wrong. Um, you know, the, the moment they're diagnosed, they, they, know, they know what the future holds. Some people, some people with motor neuron disease won't choose an assisted death, but for some people... It will be something that they desperately want and they, they won't want to suffer at the end of their lives and they won't want their loved ones to see them suffer at the end of their lives. So that's something I'll be saying to Tinwell members tomorrow is think of these people and make a law that's compassionate for them. I'm Dr Ben Harris. I'm currently president of the Isle of Man Medical Society. Anyone that's um, looked at that uh, draft bill would realise that uh, doctors were are front and centre in terms of all the processes associated with it. And therefore, it was really important to get the, the views of uh, local doctors, Alaman doctors, who would, who would actually have to deliver it uh, if, um, if the bill uh, went ahead. So that's, that's really why this, the survey was done. And from the findings of the survey, was there anything that you found that shocked you? No, not really. Um, I, I was aware beforehand that there was a great deal of concern uh, from uh, Isle of Man doctors um, about the whole principle of uh, deliberate killing, which is the ass assisted uh, assisted dying would be, um, and, and particularly the concern um, for those in society who would be potentially harmed by the bill and therefore you know that aspect of it which comes very, through very clearly in the responses was uh, expected. Now you also see that 54 percent feel it would have a negative effect on recruitment as it is I know there is a retention and recruitment problem on the island do you believe that it will worsen or intensify? Absolutely, that will be a real risk of this. Um, it, it, it is a, a, a delicate balance um, recruiting enough doctors uh, to the Isle of Man. We, we don't have a medical school on the Isle of Man uh, in the same way that we have a nursing school. So we, we're reliant on doctors being trained in the UK and then coming to the Isle of Man. As I say, it's difficult enough uh, to get to doctors over, to recruit them. And so just to have another thing that might put people off is a real concern. Equally, um, the 34% the who said that um, if this went through, they would actually, be, they would actually consider uh, leaving the Isle of Man to practice medicine elsewhere is, is particularly worrying because their doctors who are quite content to be on the Isle of Man and to work here and, and to lose even a proportion of those would, would really put further strain um, on healthcare services on the island. Now that 34%, did anyone perhaps leave a comment as to why they were, why they would leave the island? Is it against their beliefs, religion? Um, did anyone mention why? I think it was just more that they would not want to work within a health service and society 
that would feel that assisted dying was acceptable, really, that it would be so much against how, how they consider healthcare and the doctor-patient relationship to be, uh, that they wouldn't feel comfortable in that setting, that it that it would put them in it. And, and because of the way the bill is worded, those doctors would be in the invidious position of disagreeing wholeheartedly with the bill and yet be expected to actually deliver it. It's, you, you know, it's not that doctors are, if you like, just bystanders in this, um, as other members of society might be, but that they're, they're actually um, part and parcel of the whole delivery of it. And, and although there is a conscientious objection clause within the, the draft bill, as we've seen from, from other such legislation, it, it can still be very difficult for doctors uh, not to be, not to get involved, uh, whether they want to or not. So basically for them, they would be the ones that would be at the front line of, you know, determining whether a person can get it. And the, they'd also be responsible for prescribing the medication. And that's what they're, what's, that, that's what, what they don't stand for. That's not what they train for. They train to save lives and not... Am I getting it right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. 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 Um, I, dare, I dare say, um, you know, some doctors will be more involved than others. But if, if, if patients were to bring this up with doctors, doctors might find themselves having to discuss the issues, even if they did know more. And, and that that would be a thing that they they weren't happy to do. With the results of the survey, what is the society going to do? Are you going to hand it over to Dr. Allenson, hand it over to the health minister? What are you going to do with the results? Yes, in the same way that um, that the results were, were shared with the press, uh, at, at exactly the same time, the uh, results of the survey and access to the survey, uh, full survey results, was sent to each member of Timwold. So it has already been shared, and, and indeed it was shared with um, with all the all the doctors uh, on the island as well. Has anyone come back to you about that? Um, not not um, not not officially to me. Um, there, um, I think it was. It, it, well, I, I didn't send it out myself. It was um, sent out by a, a colleague, the, the, the chairman of the medical society. So I, I couldn't say exactly what response has been. In my job, you know, we always have to have balance. So we've got the medical society and the survey where doctors say that they're totally against it. But then you also see or you, you read articles about other areas, other jurisdictions also talking about introducing it there. Is it something about, you know, modern times or changing with the times? There's often um, a lot of change occurring. But what, what everybody wants are improvements. Um, some changes prove themselves to be retrograde steps. And clearly, many of the doctors of the Isle of Man feel this would be a, a retrograde step uh, to introduce this on the Isle of Man, particularly, you know, particularly to introduce this as the first jurisdiction um, in, in the UK. Um, surely it would be a much wiser um, approach uh, by uh, Tim Wald to uh, just pause at the moment. There's been a, an awful lot of de debate, uh, but, but then see what happens in the other UK jurisdictions. And then perhaps a look again uh, at this bill at a later date. Right. Um, I think from my side, I think I've got everything. Um, we, what would you like to add or what would you like to say? One fundamental aspect of the bill is that um, it relates to people who ha are said to have um, six months left to live. Um, and the implication is that that's a very easy thing for people to judge. Um, in, in actual in actual fact, uh, the the the, um, the survey is quite clear that uh, only ten percent of doctors 
thought it would be straightforward to decide who had a life expectancy of six months. Uh, and as I say, that is a, a fundamental aspect of the bill and, and, and clearly one of its one of its weaknesses. Yeah, because I, I was going to say, um, you know, we've got medical, we've got medical procedures that's involving all the time and medication that's invol- evolving all the time. So it won't be that easy to determine that six month period with with everything that's evolving. That's a very a very good point. Um, prognoses are always uncertain in healthcare. Every individual is unique and responds to disease in a whole variety of ways. More and more cancers are completely curable with modern treatments, uh, and other cancers can be ameliorated, giving the patient good quality of life for many years. Um, we've all heard many. We've all heard examples of people given an adverse prognosis, um, but actually they do better than anybody could have predicted and and, um, and their disease goes into long-term remission. And wouldn't it be a tragedy if, uh, if the person, when given that diagnosis and that, uh, and that prognosis uh, was to have the ability to opt for assisted dying and they ended up dying prematurely and when actually they could be eminently treatable. Uh, anything else you want to add or say anything that we didn't mention that you feel that, that was left out that you want to mention? I think there's one striking statistic on the results uh, was is that um, only 2.8% of doctors, so basically hardly any, think that if this bill were uh, came in, that it would have a positive psychological effect um, on citizens with vulnerabilities, either physical illness, disability, poverty, learning difficulties, and mental illness. And you know, the, the, this group um, whose welfare most needs protecting by those in authority, and yet are most likely to be harmed by this legislation. Um, and it's all, all well and good people uh, demanding choice. I want choice, I want choice. But they've surely got to think about the effect of those choices on all the people in society. I mean, and that a, a good society always has checks and balances on choices um, and, and the implications on the whole society need to be considered. Um, and, uh, and I think that's an absolutely vital point. And I, and I was delighted to see that um, that doctors um, almost unanimously, you know, could see that that that, that would be uh, a real concern and, and risk uh, for those those most vulnerable in society. The, the strength of any society is judged by how well it looks after the weak in society. Uh, I'm uh, Kathleen Desmond. I'm uh, the treasurer of Autism in Man. I'm Alan Desmond. I'm uh, past chairman of Autism in Man and a member of Autism in Man. Our stances were against it, um, not because the reasons Dr. Allenson is giving where there's unbearable suffering and someone has six months or less to live, that isn't, how, that isn't the threat as we see it in the future. Uh, I don't think there's ever been an act of any description which over time has not been amended to be something else. And this has happened elsewhere in the world. Um, for example, Holland, which has had legalized suicide or euthanasia for over 20 years now and the criteria have broadened and this is our greatest concern and this is a concern we brought up on our submission as part of Dr. Allenson's uh, public consultation. We filled in at great length and, and, and uh, we took a lot of time over this and we put our, do our doubts and our concerns into that and none of those doubts or concerns were highlighted by Dr. Allenson when he spoke about the results of that survey. None of it. Do the group feel as though it was forgotten or if it was as though it was left aside? I'd like to think we've been accidentally overlooked, but I suspect it might have been the fact that this went against the plan to get this through Timwald as a private member's bill. Now, lots of people will say if you look at the assisted dying bill, it talks about terminally ill patient uh, patients. Now, autism, autistic, being autistic, it's not terminally ill. So... Why are you guys fighting the fight that you are at the moment? 
The reason we're fighting this is because in future this legislation will likely be amended, as has occurred in Holland. Phrases such as, a patient's life is intolerable with no hope of improvement, unbearable and endless suffering, an unbearable obstacle to a normal life. Now, we looked at these things and we thought, well, you could be describing an autistic person to an outsider who was not autistic, that, in inverted commas, normal person. They would think that their lives, looking at them, were intolerable. Now, who is to say, when we as parents, in 20 years' time, or whatever, when we're gone, and our children, not only our child, but all these children, and there are dozens on the Isle of Man, hundreds of parents and family, and wider family, who is to say that when they go into the care full-time of social services and the health services, somebody somewhere in years to come will turn around and say, this person's life is intolerable and their suffering is, that they, they will not improve. They will become eligible for assisted suicide. Having said that, an autistic person probably wouldn't be able to commit suicide themselves because the legislation, as we understand it, and we've um, had discussions with other people on this, is that anyone who applied for assisted death would be given a cocktail of drugs which they themselves would take. It would not be administered by a, by a, by a, a medical professional. They would take it themselves and then they would die. It would, just, it would, it would speed their dying. That's it. Our, our youngsters, they would not be able to do that or would not understand and have the understanding. And this is why so many of the medical profession in their own survey have said that. And I think, what percentage was it, Kathleen? It was over 90%. It was 94%. There are only, yeah, 90 Eight percent, actually, of doctors um, felt that assisted dying would not have a positive effect on people with vulnerabilities, i.e. those with learning difficulties. And the doctors were particularly worried about this group, whose welfare most needs protecting by those in authority, and they're most likely to be harmed by this legislation. That's it in a nutshell, really. Mm. When you guys saw that survey and when y'all saw that 98%, did that confirm the fears that y'all probably had? Well, it did. That was the thing. We, we, were, we were heartened that the medical profession, a caring profession who've taken a Hippocratic oath to preserve life, had come out in such numbers and said, no, no, we're concerned about this. And, and for that reason, the same reason we had, that this will evolve over time to be something which it isn't. And... We know, we probably all know, people who have gone and had a diagnosis of, say, a cancer, and they've been told, you have six months to live. And I can think of a friend of mine who lived for three or four years with good quality of life. But if they'd had that prognosis, you will likely die within six months. They could have ended their life there and then. And that three or four years they would not have had with their family, they would not have had the enjoyment of life itself. And this really worrying. It's really worrying. And it should be worrying for everyone in Tinwald as well. Looking at the case in the Netherlands, did it initially start off as assisted dying and now it's kind of progressed or modified? Well, it has. But it's, uh, the incredible thing is in between 2012 and 2021, 40 people with autism were legally euthanized in, in Holland. Uh, between 2018 and 2020, the number of assisted suicides in Holland has gone up over 20%, 22%. So it's something, as I say, this all feeds into this idea that over time, more and more people become eligible. And it won't be down to Timwood members, I suspect, to broaden that. It won't be down to Dr. Allenson. What will happen is, in six months, or a year's time, or two years' time, or five years' time, someone will come along and say, my life is intolerable. For example, someone's come off their motorbike and they're paralyzed from the neck down. I want to end my life. And they will take our government to court and they will likely win that right to end their lives. That will be another group of people that will have to go on the list. We are fearful, very fearful, that people who have very little in the way of a voice, other than through their parents or their family members, will be added to that list, as has happened in Holland. So what you guys are... So what you guys are doing now, it's not... You're fighting the fight not now, but for the future generations, for the future residents of the Isle of Man. Well, quite. And we've spent 40 years um, trying to improve a lot of people with autism and their families, and I just think this is going to be a massive retrograde step for us, and it'll be a worry. And I, and Kathy and I were discussing this the other day, and with other friends who've got autistic children. The last thing that will go through our head as 
we leave this earth will be who will look after our children. And we're relying on the health service and social care and this government to do that. And we're concerned that they're not going to do that. Is there anything you'd like to add or you'd like to say? Anything you'd like to mention that we didn't touch on? Yeah, I, I'm concerned. The, the other thing that came out of the doctor survey was how just how many doctors would say that if this is passed, they will leave the Isle of Man. So those are people who are vehemently against this. Presumably, they'll be replaced by people who will come here knowing the situation and they will be fully accepting of that. So that, that you're altering the, the whole makeup of the medical profession here and altering, basically altering, the relationship between a medical practitioner and their patient. And there is one final thing, which I don't know if anyone else has brought this up, that if someone with a prognosis of less than six months to live ended their life within, say, three weeks, how much money is that going to save the health services? If this is tens, hundreds of people over years, thousands of people over years, how much money is that going to save? It, and it's worrying. It's very worrying that that could be, come, become a factor because there's a great deal of, uh, of um, cost involved in caring for the autistic people in our community. There's no question about that. And will people look at that and say, life's intolerable, no hope of improvement, tick the box, two ticks, gone. What would you like to come out from the, from the sitting, the Tinwald sitting at the end of the month? I would like my government, Tinwald, to affirm the fact that as a society, we are a caring society who care for the most vulnerable people in it, and that is the measure of any civilized society. If they vote against this, my consideration, I've already stated, I fully understand why people will say, I do not wish to see a relative suffering the way that my uncle, aunt, or indeed my own father suffered in, in the last days. But there's a bigger picture here, and people have got to look at that. Dr. Allenson hasn't looked at this at all, as far as I can see, because he's made no contact with us whatsoever. I think it's a case of, can I be the first person in the British Isles to get this groundbreaking and uh, fantastic legislation through so that we can help so many people? But the the people he will help may be way more outweighed by the people that will harm in the years to come. Right. Can I start with your name and your title? My name is Kevin Ewell, Professor Kevin Ewell, and I'm Chief Executive Officer of Humanists Against Assisted Suicide and Euthanasia. I'm over here to speak to the Tinwald um, about the possible introduction of legislation. I believe you'll be having a debate about this on the 31st. And I want to influence that debate and show you uh, people on the island why they shouldn't legalize assisted suicide and euthanasia. Now, what's your views on it? Well, I'm an atheist, and but I am generally liberal. I support abortion rights for women. Um, I oppose capital punishment. And in some, in some ways, I don't oppose the odd case of assisted suicide and or euthanasia. But what I object to is a change in the law. I'm against the institutionalization of assisted suicide and or euthanasia. Um, and I believe that making it a medical procedure is a very bad idea. Now, when you say that uh, making it a medical procedure is a bad idea, can you elaborate a little more on that? Well, of course, it is at basis killing. It's, you know, that I know a lot of people don't like that sort of language, but that I think we should speak plainly about this. And I don't think it's necessary for a doctor to do that killing. It could be just about anybody. And um, as... A, a GP friend of mine made a point. She said the very best way of actually stopping somebody's life painlessly is a guillotine. And that sort of brings it home what we're talking about. It is it is killing. And I don't think making killing part of medical procedure is ever going to be a good idea. Much as I'm an atheist, I do like the commandment, thou shalt not kill. And I think that's one worth keeping. The reason why I ask that is because last week the medical society, um, the doctor society actually released a survey 
and nearly 74% of doctors had said that they weren't comfortable with it, with the, with the proposal if it went ahead. And 34% of those said they would consider leaving the island if it did come into, for, into play. So um, hearing that and having said what you said, you know, what do you make of that? Well, I think it would be a nightmare to implement as well as being a, a sort of wrong on principle. I think it it would be a very difficult thing. What do you, you know, would it be provided by the health service here? Uh, would it be free? Everything else is free. Would it be organized along the lines of abortion, for instance, which I believe has recently come in um, on the island? And... Um, I think there are quite a few devils in the detail, uh, if if you see what I mean. And I think it would be very difficult to convince doctors that this will be part of what they do. I, and I think if you know, if I'm having a bad day doing in my profession, I can't imagine a doctor who's come away having killed, purposefully killed somebody. I don't think that would be a good situation. So I completely understand why doctors are up in arms about this. Uh, what concerns do you have if it does get approved? Well, I think, first of all, people on this island, it would become Death Island. I think one of the first safeguards that goes is the one where you have to have residency. So it's based, I believe, on the Oregon legislation that's gone through. But uh, Oregon has dropped its residency requirement. And I think there would be enormous pressure, given that most people from the UK who uh, opt for this fly to Switzerland to have it done. I think there would be a lot of pressure to have it done here. And plus, of course, with the reciprocal health agreement you have with the UK, then it means that anybody who comes here has to get medical treatment. Um, so I think it will be a bit of a nightmare if it is done. And I, I completely understand why the doctors are up in arms. There's another group that I met with yesterday. They're a local group called Autism in Man. And they're parents or people who are either autistic or they have kids who's autistic. And I said to them, you know, it's a terminal illness bull. Autism isn't a terminal illness. And the parents actually highlighted that in the Netherlands, they've had assisted dying for about 20 years. And now the bull has been altered and autistic people are being, are being, you know, uh, they, they, euthanized. They, yes. Yeah, they, they, they're being told their life is unbearable, and you know they're getting onto the list, and that's their fears that once the bill is in place, it can be amended to add more people on. Could that perhaps be, you know, something that happens here? Uh, not just perhaps. I would predict it because in every nation where it has been implemented, it is expanded beyond its original remit. So uh, the Netherlands has expanded, for instance, recently. It will actually, I think that's in the future. Certainly Belgium has expanded to children of every age. Um, in the Netherlands, it's expanded in 2006, and I'm remembering that. Uh, but it's also going to be extended to children of every age. And of course, because it's medical if it's a medical procedure, how can you deny it to anybody who needs it? And so I do know of at least eight cases in the Netherlands where there have been people with autism and no other underlying disease uh, euthanized, mostly because they could not cope with a change in the circumstances and or their parents were very worried about what happened after they died. And I think that shows you the sort of possibilities, the kind of horrific possibilities that, that come. And, it, and it's happened everywhere outside of the United States where it's, it's in individual states. And, and in any nation where it's, it's uh, been in place for a while, it has certainly expanded. Canada is the most egregious example of that, where having been legalized in 2016, it was expanded in 2020 to, to get rid of the, what they call, uh, reasonably foreseen death and therefore, anybody with a permanent disability can apply for it on the basis that they are suffering. And who's to say they aren't suffering? That's a, it's a subjective thing. It's not a medical assessment that somebody's suffering. It, it is the, a, the person suffering themselves who define it. Why is it 
evolving so much? Is it because, you know, we have to kind of keep up with the times and that's why these bills are evolving so much? I think they're being, first of all, there's a hugely well-organized and well-funded lobby that's that's going for these bills uh, because I've been talking about this subject for 25 years and I've seen their growth. So they're very, very well-funded and it's a group of activists who wish to put this uh, through. And I think that's one of the reasons why these bills are coming up is because they are having some influence. And I think the other aspect why they're coming up now is because a lot of people are in that post-religious perspective. And I think that's a real problem. And that's something that we try and do in, in Hayes is point out that this isn't just a religious subject. It's not just enlightened uh, rationalism versus religious dogma. I think there are many, many other issues at stake that people should be paying attention to. Right. Um, how hopeful are you that after today's talk, you're going to get the message out there? Well, I'm really hoping that that's, that's why I'm here. Um, I'm not paid to come here. I, I do this, uh, you know, just because I, I believe uh, this is a very, very important thing. And I would like to have some sort of influence. I'm very hopeful because in 2015, I was outside the parliament buildings at Westminster in London where we defeated the bill that was uh, the Maris bill, as it was at the time, that would have legalized assisted suicide and uh, not euthanasia, just assisted suicide. And I think there are real problems with a bill here, having read through it. One thing it does is sneak through euthanasia. Now, where euthanasia and assisted suicide are legal, which is Canada and the Netherlands, it's, people opt for euthanasia almost every time because it's a much more reliable way of ensuring somebody's death. And I think that's what, you know, again, I can understand the doctors being up in arms because they will have to be doing this. They won't just be prescribing. They will generally have to be doing this. And I think the bill is purports to be based on Oregon. But of course, Oregon only assisted suicide is allowed. There is no um, provision for euthanasia. So I think I'd like to influence and just sort of say to everybody, think again. Uh, that's the most important message I've got. Just the only th other thing I would add is that there is a report that's just come out from Canada. I've only just seen it today. I think it came out yesterday. And there's a 32% rise in Canadian deaths. So what we do know about where euthanasia is legalized is that euthanasia deaths go up hugely in the time. It's, in the Netherlands, there's been one year where it's gone down, but it's gone back up well past that level now. That was 2019. It's gone well past that level now, and it's gone up again this year. So I think anybody who doesn't think that these categories are going to expand, that the numbers are going to expand, really needs to look at this closely. Thank you for making it to the end of the Little Manx Radio newscast. You are obviously someone with exquisite taste. May I politely suggest you might want to subscribe to this and a wide range of Manx Radio podcasts at your favourite podcast provider so our best bits will magically appear on your smartphone. Thank you. Thank you.